China requires colleges across the country to send their graduates to the West, the poor regions. This is considered a means to solve employment difficulties. A woman was deemed mentally insane for opposing Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping. When she protested, she was reportedly abducted by authorities. The Chinese Communist regime is the greatest threat to the free world. This, according to the top U.S. intelligence official. And attorney Lin Wood claims the Chinese regime bought Dominion for $400 million. There is no direct proof of the claim, but public information does show ties between China, a Swiss bank, and Dominion. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. First, we looked at China's unemployment situation. China's Ministry of Education issued a notice earlier this week detailing how colleges and universities should guide this year's graduating class on finding work. The notice requires colleges across the country to send their graduates to the West toward poorer regions that have been labeled key employment areas. According to official figures, 8.7 million Chinese students graduated college this year, a historical high. The record is expected to be broken again next year with 9 million or more. Earlier this year, the director of the Employment Promotion Department, part of China's Ministry of Human Resources, made a statement on the topic. He admitted that under the influence of the pandemic, college graduates are facing difficulty in obtaining employment. Market demand has fallen and companies have delayed recruiting new workers. Chinese authorities had already extended efforts in recent months to make the country's employment figure look better. A previous notice from the Ministry of Education added new jobs to the employment list, including online shop owners, social media celebrities and electronic sports players. These people will no longer be considered as unemployed, regardless of how much they earn. The recent notice encouraging college graduates to work in China's undeveloped West is seen as an even bigger attempt to solve the unemployment problem. Some scholars say the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, is embracing a similar mindset as during the time of the down-to-the-countryside political movement back in the 1960s and 1970s. At the time, about 20 million high school and middle school graduates were forced out of cities and effectively exiled to remote areas of China. Some of them were forced to stay there for two decades. They lost their opportunity to attend college and work towards getting a better job later in life. This group is often referred to as China's lost generation. Current CCP head Xi Jinping was also among them. One of the goals of the movement was to solve employment problems plaguing China at the time. Li Yunhua, a former associate professor at Beijing Capital Normal University, says he believes the current effort won't yield the results regime officials are hoping for. He explained that many college students from impoverished areas go to college in order to change their destiny and seek a better life through education, adding that it's not possible for them to go back to poverty-stricken areas. Now we look to an unusual political meeting in Beijing. U.S. President Trump delivered a speech on Wednesday addressing election fraud. He reiterated his belief that his re-election as president is unstoppable. A few hours later, the standing committee of the CCP Political Bureau suddenly held a closed-door meeting. The seven men of this committee are the most powerful men in China, with Xi Jinping as their head. Both the timing and the content of their meeting attracted attention. The CCP's political bureau had already held a meeting just four days before. China affairs commentator Zhong Yuan, speaking to the Epoch Times, questioned why it was necessary to hold another standing committee meeting in such a short time. According to Chinese state-run media, Xi Jinping delivered a speech at the second meeting about poverty. Zhong pointed out the CCP leaders have already addressed this issue many times recently. Zhong believed, therefore, that this was not the real topic of the meeting and that the real topic was the international situation. The CCP's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the party media also seem to have acted differently since. The spokesperson of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs suddenly stopped the so-called wolf warrior style of slamming other countries with vicious words. And the wording on U.S.-China relations on state-run media has softened suddenly as well, right after Trump's speech.
Xi Jinping already congratulated Trump's rival Joe Biden. Zhong believes that he got scared hearing Trump says his re-election is unstoppable. And the CCP top leaders held a meeting to work out how to deal with the subsequent situation. A young Chinese woman was sent to a mental hospital after she defaced a photo of Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping. She's now reportedly missing after expressing the injustice she endured online. Now, more on the story by NTD's Don Ma. A 31-year-old Chinese activist has disappeared. That's after she protested against the Chinese regime on Twitter. Dong Yaocheng, dubbed Ink Girl on Chinese social media, exposed the abuse she endured from Chinese authorities in a video. There's been no activity on her social media account since Tuesday. Some are now speculating that authorities abducted her. At present, Ink Girl's video, as well as her other posts, have been deleted from Twitter. The original abuse she suffered from Chinese regime officials came as punishment for splashing ink on a photo of communist leader Xi Jinping in public back in 2018. She's since been sent to a mental hospital twice for a total of nearly two years. Authorities are still monitoring her after her release by forcing her to work for them. That's because officials fear she might publicly oppose the regime again. In the now-removed Twitter video, she expressed her thoughts on what she calls the injustice she's facing. She explained that she wasn't even allowed to see her father when he had an accident at work, adding that she wants her freedom back. She asserts that she's a mentally sane person and denies wrongdoing. Dong was arrested the very day she spilled ink onto Xi's photo. Authorities consider her action the same as attacking state leaders. As a result, she was forced to receive psychiatric treatment for more than a year. Earlier this year, during the regime's important two sessions conference, Dong was taken to a psychiatric institution again, this time for more than a month. She was detained there in order to make sure she didn't publicly oppose the regime during this time, to ensure the success of the lawmaking conference. Dong's father told us that she was forced to take medication inside the psychiatric institution. He says the once lively and cheerful young woman became reserved, nervous, and sometimes unresponsive afterward. She was forced to take psychotropic drugs. Inside, she took so much drugs. She seemed out of it every day. During this time, we couldn't communicate with her. She's different from before. She seems scared of everything. In July, after being discharged from the hospital the second time, she developed symptoms of dementia and became unresponsive. She soon became incontinent and would reportedly panic and scream during the night. Hong Kong media tycoon and pro-democracy activist Jimmy Lai was denied bail on Thursday. He's been charged with fraud related to the lease of a building that houses his newspaper, Apple Daily. Hong Kong media tycoon and pro-democracy campaigner Jimmy Lai was denied bail on Thursday. Lai and two of his senior executives are facing a charge of fraud relating to the lease of a building that houses Lai's Apple Daily, an anti-government tabloid. Authorities have intensified a crackdown on key opposition figures in the Chinese-ruled city following Beijing's imposition of a national security law on June 30th. The new law punishes anything China considers subversion, secession, terrorism and collusion with foreign forces. Lau and his colleagues are accused of falsely representing the use of their office to their landlord. While a fraud charge does not fall under the new law, the case marks another crackdown on pro-democracy figures. Lau's appearance in court came just a day after one of Hong Kong's most prominent activists, Joshua Wong, was jailed for more than 13 months for his role in an unlawful anti-government rally in 2019. Back in August, Lau was arrested after about 200 police raided his offices. 
Hong Kong police later said they had arrested nine men and one woman for suspected offences, including collusion with a foreign country to endanger national security. Lau has been a frequent visitor to Washington, where he's met with senior officials to rally support for Hong Kong's democracy, prompting Beijing to label him a traitor. The director of U.S. Nation Security says the Chinese regime is the greatest threat to the United States and the free world. In a December 3rd op-ed, he called the threat a once-in-a-generation challenge. The nation's top intelligence official says the Chinese regime is the greatest threat to the United States and the free world. Director of National Intelligence John Ratcliffe wrote a commentary in the Wall Street Journal on Thursday. He said he has access to more intelligence than any member of the U.S. government other than the president. He says this gives him a unique vantage point, and the intelligence is clear. Beijing wants to dominate the United States and the rest of the world. He pointed out that the U.S. now faces a choice between two of what he called incompatible ideologies, adding that the country will be judged by how we respond to China's effort to replace America as the dominant superpower. Also in the commentary, he revealed the Chinese Communist Party is targeting U.S. Congress members with six times the frequency of Russia and 12 times more than Iran. In an interview with CBS News, Ratcliffe described what's behind Beijing's aggressive approach. So they want laws and policies out of the United States that are favorable to China. And what they're really trying to do is, through blackmail, through bribery, through overt and covert influence, trying to make sure that only laws that are favorable to China are passed. He added that communist China is the greatest challenge that the U.S. has faced since World War II, saying every generation has a challenge. Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, the Iron Curtain, this generation's challenge is China's intent to replace the United States as the world's superpower. The Trump administration has tightened visa rules restricting how long Chinese Communist Party members are allowed to stay in the country. The State Department published the statement on Thursday. The new visa policy reduces the maximum validity of B-1, B-2 visitor visas for party members and their families. The duration has been reduced from 10 years to just one month. The statement says the measure is aimed at protecting the nation from the CCP's malign influence, adding that the CCP works to influence Americans through propaganda, economic coercion and other nefarious activities. It said the CCP also sends agents to the United States to unabashedly monitor, threaten and report on Chinese nationals and Chinese American groups. The Trump administration added China's top chipmaker and an oil giant to the U.S. defense blacklist. A total of four additional companies were designated as owned or controlled by the Chinese military. The companies include SMIC, Sinook, China Construction Technology, and China International Engineering Consulting Corps. The move takes the total number of blacklisted companies to 35. A recent executive order by President Trump will prevent U.S. investors from buying the blacklisted firm securities starting late next year. Shares of oil giant Sinook had fallen nearly 14 percent after the news and tumbled just under 4 percent by Friday's market close. Chipmaker SMIC relies heavily on equipment from U.S. suppliers and was already in Washington's crosshairs. Now we look to India. A money laundering network was raided by Indian tax officials. The network was supported by China's army, aiming to fund Pakistan's intelligence agency and disrupt peace in India. This happened a few months ago, but was only revealed last week by Indian media, citing the country's Ministry of Home Affairs. A Chinese national was arrested at the raid. He reportedly had a fake Indian identity and was involved in five Indian firms as a board member and shareholder. On top of that, he held 40 Indian bank accounts. He was accused of having a connection to the Chinese army and supporting Pakistan's intelligence. India and Pakistan have been involved in wars and conflicts for decades. Initially, it was reported the money laundering totaled $135 million. But media reports say it could be much more than this. The investigation is still ongoing. Two other Chinese nationals are also under investigation. Georgia attorney Lynn Wood claims that the Chinese regime sent Dominion $400 million ahead of the election. That's through a Swiss bank subsidiary. There is no direct proof of the claim, but public information does show ties between China, the bank and Dominion.
Attorney Linwood claimed on December 1st that Communist China purchased Dominion voting for $400 million. He published a link to a U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission filing showing Dominion Voting System's parent company receiving $400 million from a Swiss bank subsidiary. The transaction itself does not directly show what the attorney alleges it to be. However, it does show ties between the voting software company and the Chinese regime. The transaction happened less than a month before the election. According to a press release, the party that received the money, Staple Street Capital, acquired Dominion Voting System in 2018. The acquirer calls itself a New York-based middle market private equity firm. The party that paid the money is UBS Securities LLC, a subsidiary of Swiss investment bank UBS. But UBS is not necessarily the eventual buyer in the transaction. As an investment firm, it could have just served as a middleman, selling partnership interests of Staple Street Capital to UBS clients or holding it on behalf of clients through its prime broker. So how is this related to the Chinese Communist Party? In another Twitter post, Linwood claims the Chinese regime to be the major shareholder of the middleman UBS securities. Through state entities, China does own much stock of UBS's Beijing-based joint venture. But the joint venture's name is UBS Securities Co. Limited, whereas the entity sending money to Dominion is UBS Securities LLC, which is based in New York. The New York subsidiary is a private firm, so its shareholders' information is not open to the public. However, a closer look into the New York subsidiary shows that among four of its board members who are appointed by shareholders, three appear to be Chinese. One of them is Ye Xiang, a Chinese national, who also served as a board member of the Beijing-based UBS. The person had worked at the Chinese regime's central bank, the state-owned Bank of China, as well as the Hong Kong government's financial regulatory agencies. UBS is the first foreign bank that's allowed to have a fully licensed security joint venture in China's very restricted financial market. The facilitator of the joint venture is Chinese Vice Premier Wang Qishan, who is deemed the most finance-savvy communist official. He was the mayor of Beijing in 2006 when he met with UBS's then-chairman Marcel Ospel. According to a Chinese company profiling website, after the 2020 election, the Beijing UBS went through a major leadership turnover on November the 30th. One day before Lin was tweet about UBS, 12 out of his 15 board of directors quit, including Ye Xiang, the New York UBS board member mentioned earlier. Another who just quit the board is Cheng Yixun, the former CEO of UBS's Beijing-based joint venture and an expert hired in the Chinese Communist Party's Thousand Talents program. The U.S. Senate deems the program a threat to U.S. national security. According to the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, UBS is among the major Western banks that played a key role as middlemen in helping Chinese communist officials set up trusts and companies at offshore centers usually associated with hidden wealth. The SEC filing shows only two transactions related to Dominion's parent company. Both are from UBS's New York subsidiary. Other than the $400 million transaction in October, Dominion received $200 million from UBS in 2014. In a previous voter fraud lawsuit filed by Sidney Powell, a former military intelligence official claimed in an affidavit that Chinese operatives had access to Dominion voting system in several key states. Penny Zhou, NTD News. A woman in the UK is pleading for her abducted mother in China to be released. Her mother practices an ancient spiritual discipline, which continues to be persecuted by the Chinese Communist Party. Here's our UK correspondent Jane Wirrell with more. These are the only photos Ming Hui Yu has with her mother. Speaking from the UK, she tells us the news that her mother, Mei Hong Wang, has been abducted in China again. They take the, everything away from her, including computers, uh, a computer, a USB, and uh, her keys. Yu's family was forced to split up almost 20 years ago. Her parents practice Falun Gong, an ancient Chinese meditation practice that follows the principles of truth, compassion and tolerance. In 1999, then leader of the Chinese Communist Party, also known as the CCP, ordered the eradication of Falun Gong. And this year, there have been more cases of practitioners being persecuted. They're, they're, a, they're a, a very gentle people. 
the Falun Gong. Um, um, they're certainly not controversial. And, um, they, they just want to be able to worship in, in their way that they can. Uh, I believe that every person across the world has a, has a, a, a right and, and uh, should be given the right to worship wherever they can, whenever they can, and whatever way they want to. Yu found out her mother was illegally detained, then sent to Harbin City Hospital Police Station and has called them every day. Sometimes she gets through. Told me they didn't give me any, any um, clear information or any clear reason. So they just told me something like, you don't talk with policemen about law or regulation. A 2007 report says the hospital has a backyard where Falun Gong practitioners have been previously murdered. Executive Director of the Falun Dafa Information Centre, Levi Browdy, says what CCP officials fear the most is public pressure. We've got, even had uh, government officials that have said, give me the phone number to the, the labour camp or the detention centre where this person is being held and pick up the phone and call them. This kind of pressure is really what helps the most, and we've seen many cases where immediately they'll back out. They'll sort of back down, sometimes they'll even release people. Member of Parliament Jim Shannon says he can directly take Yu's mother's case up with the UK Foreign Secretary. Yes, it's not about me, it's about my mother. I hope the authority could release her right now and, uh, and stop the persecution. She hopes the persecution will end not just for her parents, but for the millions who are persecuted for their faith in her native China. Jane Rural, NTD News, London. And that's all for today's China In Focus. Thanks for watching and see you next time.